Alright, I think we're going to get started with the next, uh, the next thing. Just to make sure that Brian has enough time. So I'll point out that this, um, this next thing that he's going to do, uh, a little bit later, is, is, uh, it's like the first time we've ever done this. It'll be kind of a new experiment. Um, so let me first give you a little bit of an introduction to Brian. Um, so Brian, I've known Brian for, I think, about, like, 12 years now. Um, uh, we first met at, uh, at a meeting, actually, in the UK, and it was, and, and around about that time, too, he, he had just started this company in, uh, in Portland, um, Oregon, and we interacted a little bit right when I was starting my lab, and he was starting company as well, about very similar sorts of time. Um, uh, so Brian is, a, is actually a, a non-traditional graduate student in, in our lab. Um, as I said, he's been, he had a company around about the same time I started um, uh, our lab, and then when he was looking around to go and complete a PhD, he... Uh, chose to come work uh, here um, at the University of Washington Department of Genome Sciences. Uh, he has a strong background in mass spectrometry and, and pretty software. And a lot of the stuff that he's been doing here has been in collaboration with uh, Judith Nien, who's a, um, uh, an expert in phosphoproteomics. Um, so uh, I think what, what you're going to hear is kind of a little bit on his take on data intent recognition. Uh, he's definitely uh, extended our thinking a lot about it over the uh, over the last couple of years, but you know, and uh, I think he's kind of, I think he uh, he found some very interesting things. I think uh, overall, and uh, he's definitely made some significant improvements from the tool. And one of the tools I'll discuss actually is something that was that he kind of helped another graduate student work on to build on, and there'll be new tools that kind of bridge that and take that next step further in the near future. Anyway. Um, so, before we start, uh, first things first, um, we need to make sure that you have Java installed, uh, which was hopefully discussed earlier. Does anyone not have Java installed? Awesome. Okay. And um, you're going to need to download two things from uh, the website. So, this is the main participants website here. And if you just go to the website and then hit refresh, these two items here, the tutorial, and this program called Walnut, which is something that we're going to demo here for the very first time. Um, but make sure you download these two, okay? So, Is everyone at least down? You don't see it. It's, you see the court stage? Did you hit refresh? It should be right at the top. It should be one dash. Sometimes you have to, you 
you have to look for things that you don't ever have a record of. Right? So in this last tutorial, we talked about seeing um, peptides that you could have already found in media and already have a pretty good example of with your media. Now, you can come up with tons of reasons why that wouldn't necessarily work in all circumstances. Maybe instead of working on humans, you might be working on something unusual, like uh, a virus, like malaria, or something else that's like an infection that doesn't have, that might have a genome, that you might have a genome sequence for, but you won't necessarily have a full, deep EDA library for absolutely everything. Another good example, actually, of this would be if you were interested in splicing, even with people, with humans, right? Um, there are a lot of interesting splice junctions, but the only way that I'd be able to measure these sort of things is, is if you can see that peptide in between. And probably not everyone has selected those peptides to put in the library. And uh, oftentimes, they might not necessarily even be in great central repository. So if you look at, say, for example, in this library, this is probably the largest library of spectra um, that is publicly available. Uh, it's almost entirely CAG data with low res data. But more importantly, it only covers about 20% of what we think is the noble sodium. Uh, so it's very likely that if you're after a specific data, you might not be able to have an actual spectrum for it. And it might be cost prohibitive for you to be able to buy it um, or synthesize it, particularly if it's a very long time. Peptides that have more than like 25 amino acids are have a very, very bad synthesis rate. Right? Okay. So starting with that sort of motivation, um, I think Jared showed this slide earlier today, uh, where he was talking about the differences between thinking about uh, typical search engines like you do with EDA and then sort of these peptide centric models you get with DA. So uh, the way you do this with EDA is you take your MSMS spectrum set, you would search every and say, what's the best peptide that matches this specific spectrum? And then come up with the list and then filter it down. Well, if you're dealing with uh, a peptide centric model, such as with DIA data, you basically take a peptide of interest and you scan it across the file and say, do you want to have any evidence for this particular peptide? And so then you get a yes or no. And actually, that's a really nice thing because now you have a zero point, right? Now we have a real zero point as opposed to DDA, where you don't necessarily have a true knowledge that it is not in your sample, okay? Where there is not enough evidence for it in your sample. All right, so the way in which this sort of stuff will work, um, and what we're going to talk about here is uh, a program called uh, Pecan. That, uh, and this is a slide stolen here by Sonia Ping. Um, Sonia just published this paper, uh, or it's in press right now in Nature Methods. And so, um, and that's what we're going to talk about here today. So, the way in which a program like this works is it's basically like trying to do PQuest or Comet or Mascot on uh, DIA data. Okay? And again, and I'm going to do it in a peptide centric way. So instead of having a spectrum library spectrum, you have this sort of theoretical spectrum that you say, okay, I, I have unit intensities for everything, and I just want to see does this collection of ions exist? somewhere in my data file. So you take that and you try to match it against every scan in the entire file. Okay? And again, you come up with this score right, for every scan in that entire file, and you say, OK, this is the high point here. This is the most likely spot for the detection, the identification. Okay? So for Colin, when you think about it, this, this is a really hard problem. right? Instead of knowing anything about retention time, which you don't, if you're just guessing, right? And you don't know anything about fragmentation, again, you're just guessing. It's a really hard problem to try to find this particular peptide in a data file. And so oftentimes, programs um, that take the approach like the con actually don't do as well uh, as if you were doing a, a um, spectrum library search, uh, because you just don't have enough information about the data file, right? Um, but the con is not alone in this. Uh, other programs like CI Empire, but again, try to take an approach of, of not knowing anything about the data before trying to analyze it, um, also have the same kind of problem. Um, in that they don't necessarily do as well um, as if you had a lot of extra information. Oh, right? Okay. So um, that said, there are some really good uses for Pecan um, that go beyond just looking at a single file. So, so here I've got a, um, a, like a representation of an acquisition here. 
Okay, I'm scanning from 400 to 1,000 in 24, um, MZ, uh, 25 windows of 24 MZY of windows. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so um, if you were smart and how a sample, if you were lucky to have enough sample, um, you could actually do two acquisitions, right? And this is what we call gas phase fractionation, where in the first acquisition, you'd scan from 400 to 700 with 12 MZY windows. So much narrower, much less likelihood for interference. And you do two scans. You know, it's expensive, you have to, you know, collect twice as much data, but at the other hand, you know, if you're doing a DDA approach, you might be thinking about, thinking about like alkaline fractionation and other sort of chemical mechanisms for collecting a lot more data. This is basically the same thing, but you're using the mass spectrometer to do all the fractionation instead. Much easier to do it like that. Okay. So one of the nice things is that uh, Pecan and other programs like this actually do really well with this gas phase fractionated data. So here's a, an example from Sonia's uh, Impress paper um, where she's looking with Pecan at um, uh, the peptides that she can identify on this particular data set. Okay, so if she does one gas phase fraction, that's basically one sample across the entire proteome, she gets, you know, uh, about 5,000 peptides. That's not that much, but it's something, right? And if she does two, she gets another 3,000. And if she does four, she gets another 4,000, right? And so all in total, if you were to think about the, the world of, of peptides that were detected by one of those, that by that 4X gas phase fraction is simple, it's substantially more than the equivalent that you get with DDA, right? So with DDA, um, DDA, because it's not like designed for this type of experiment, actually doesn't gain anything when you actually drill down. And that's because of the heuristics involved in which uh, which uh, precursors you want to pick to do the acquisition. Okay? Uh, and this uh, rears its head, I think, more strongly in uh, looking at protein level data, where really the single gas phase fraction is a subset of what you can see if you drill down and do two acquisitions, which is a subset of what you see if you drill down and do four acquisitions. Make sense? And again, you don't really get that benefit with DDA. So this is a particular case. If you can run an experiment like this, you can actually do a lot better with a program like Pecan than you could with um, with a, a program like uh, uh, like Comet with DDA. Okay. So um, and let's kind of talk about why. And I want to show you a, 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 a deeper example. So instead of doing two fractions here, let's take that and do six fractions. Okay. Now I've got a situation where I'm looking from 400 to 500 with four MZY wide windows. Uh, if we do um, some sort of a, an optimization, a trick that we call overlapping windows, um, you can essentially get the isolation down to two MZY. wide. Now you're basically talking about PRM across the entire data set for every single peptide. Does that make sense? Right? And so here, you could basically use, I mean, you can honestly use comments to search so you get much better results if you're using a program like Pecan because it actually can look across the chromatogram and know about the shape of peaks and that sort of thing. Okay, but if you end up acquiring a whole bunch of these fractions, you know it's kind of expensive to do something like this. But you get a huge amount of data when you think about it, right? I mean, this is this is targeted quality data without actually having to target anything. Um, so very expensive. But we've been working on this workflow here, um, which I think has been extremely productive for us uh, uh, in the lab, where we basically, you know, if you're going to do a quantitative experiment, you're probably going to want to collect, you know, 50, 60, 100 different samples or, or biological samples, something like that, if you, if you want to do like a real quantitative experiment. So the approach that we've been taking is to essentially take an aliquot off the top of every one of those samples, just a microliter or whatever, Put them into a pool and then collect these narrow library data sets like this and detect all of the peptides you can in this PRM quality data. And then with your N quantitative samples, you end up taking these detections and then transferring them over with time. Okay? And so this is, I think, a really productive workflow that can get you very far, I think. Um, so I'm not going to actually teach how you do this because it will require you know, a lot more data that we would want to be able to analyze in, I guess, 45 minutes uh, before Lindsay, uh, before, I guess we're having a break next, um, so before you get the break. But 
I just want to put this seed in your in, in your uh, mind's eye that it is possible to use a program like this to do, I think, very deep level proteomics, um, even if you're uh, collecting just one acquisition per sample, as long as you create these libraries. And what we're calling these libraries are chromatogram libraries, because they have uh, information about um, uh, the fragmentation patterns that you can see in DIA data, they have information about this specific retention patterns um, that, you, uh, that you detect in these narrow window data sets. So they're much easier to transfer those detections over to the sound. Okay? Um, so, so, again, as I said here, uh, we're going to introduce this program. Um, this is the first time that we've ever shown it to anyone outside the lab. Uh, so, so this is very exciting. Hopefully nothing breaks in the tutorial. Um, this is a program called Walnut, which is a tool that is uh, sort of like a baton. Um, uh, like the comparison between Sonia and I, um, it's you know slightly more wrinkly and uh, probably significantly more better. Um, <laughs> and so this program, I want to show you just initially how to use it by fun, and then we'll actually play around with it, and then you guys can take it home and and use this. Uh, your heart's content. Okay, so uh, Walnut uses photonic scoring. It's got this panel of parameters. And these parameters, many of these parameters are like DDA style search engine stuff. Okay? The digestion enzyme you want to use, the max tolerance that you want to use, the number of charts, like the charge state range that you want to look for, and that sort of thing. Okay. Um, so this should be stuff that you are, in general, fairly familiar with, but we'll look at it more specifically uh, in a bit. So, um, there's this one button here uh, called Add MDML. You load MDML, the Hupo standard file, into this. Um, you can create them using your um, uh, your raw file reader uh, for your specific instrument, or you can use Pretty Wizard, um, which is a tool that will convert these for you automatically. And it's a free, freely available tool. Um, and then there's this third button, uh, which is Save Feeling. And that's literally all you do with this program. So, um, looking at that parameter list, uh, there are, uh, instead of having a, a single FASTA database, um, you actually have two FASTA database options. Um, by default, it will set one to the other. So, basically, you set a background database and a target database. So, the background is just sort of um, what your proteome looks like. So, if you're searching human samples, which we're going to do in a bit, uh, you'll load in a human FASTA database into this. For your target database, you can, again, search every protein in humans, but that's going to take an awful lot of time. Uh, and so we're only going to show you an example where you search just a small subset of a human database. And so this program enables you to be able to do that, mainly because your search statistics are much better if you narrow down the things that you're actually looking for. Okay. Um, there are a couple of options for acquisition settings, um, uh, which, in general, you probably don't want to touch. The only reason why you would want to is if Using a program that is, uh, or using a, an instrument that is uh, unusually set up, um, and then and then there's a set of search parameters. Again, these are the same kind of things that you're used to seeing: the uh, digestion enzyme, your fixed modification settings, your fragmentation pattern, um, your mass tolerances, your number of miscleavages, that kind of thing. Okay, uh, okay so uh, that's that. Um, so what we're actually going to do is do a, a proper tutorial where I'm going to walk you through how to use this program. Um, we're doing it up here, uh, but you should follow along with it and go through all these steps, okay, um, on your computer. So on, uh, I don't know where your thumb drive is, here it's just the app drive. Um, in tutorials slash pecan, there is a directory of files, okay? Um, a couple of these are in the MLs, a couple of them are these FASTA databases. Uh, do you guys have any trouble finding it? Anyone not able to find this? Great. Okay. Um, so uh, there were two files that I had you download. One was a PDF, and the other one was a, uh, a dot .jar, and that's a Java uh, executable file. Okay. So um, let's hope this works. Uh, okay, great. Yes, so um, so this right here is the PDF that you should be looking for. 
Um, and it's just talking about uh, a walkthrough for what we're doing right here. Um, Lindsay and I were up late last night trying to make sure that everything worked. Uh, so um, there's probably a lot of bugs. Uh, uh, yes, all of them are introduced by me. Okay. So, um, so honestly, the first thing that you're actually going to do is open up this, uh, this walnut. And uh, basically, you just double click on it. And hopefully, it brings up a GUI dialog. Does anyone have trouble with this so far? Do you guys not have it, or? Okay, Tina. You think the instructor just jumped like that? Okay, so does everyone have a, a, a page like this? It's good? No one have any trouble? Okay, awesome. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is load up the databases themselves. Um, so right here, uh, under so these guys are red. They're basically the only thing you, you definitely need to set a database and a target, right? A background and a target. So I'm going to click Edit here, and I'm going to navigate to um, my F drive. And I'm going to find that pecan directory here. And then there's these two FASTAs here. There's a, a, an mTOR specific and a human. This is uh, 9606 is the taxonomy for human. Okay, so for the background, again, the background needs to be a representation of what the podium looks like. So if we're looking at human samples, we should open up the 9606 FASTA right there. Okay? Now, by default, it's going to set that target to be um, the same so that you could do the search off of the entire human database. But uh, that will take forever. Uh, and so I'm going to set as the, the target database this mTOR specific factor. Okay. So this experiment here is, um, is a kind of a uh, in which I did some simulation too. And basically, all I'm interested in. Just selected out. I went to Joker, I typed in the box mTOR, and then there are 150 or so proteins that are associated with mTOR in Unicode. I downloaded them and that's what we have here. Okay, so if you're following along with the PDF, um, the next thing you want to do is make sure that all of the settings are correct. So it's trypsin. Uh, you are using carbamidomethylation uh, for capping the cysteines. Um, fragmentation patterns, because these are Q-exactives, uh, use HCD. This is basically beam-type fragmentation. So if you're using a, a, a TOF, you would, again, use HCD as your setting. Um, and then you've got two uh, tolerances. These are 10 ppm by default. You should leave them at 10 ppm. Um, and we'll set one miscleavage uh, and to use percolator three and five quantitative ions. The charge range should be two to three. So again, everything should be default um, because what we're doing is a really vanilla analysis. Here, okay. Um, so uh, as I said, there were literally two steps uh, after setting your parameters. Um, we're going to add the MZMLs. Um, so here there are these two MZMLs in here. And this is a pre-stimulation and a post-stimulation effectively. And then I'm just going to hit open. Um, I, uh, I cheated a little bit because this uh, processing actually takes a little bit of time. It might take about 20 minutes to do analysis here, um, even for the mTOR database, uh, for both files at the same time. So what I did is actually preloaded some data So it should have come up automatically like this as green options. Um, and so basically it's uh, one that just goes back and says, oh, uh, you've already analyzed this data, so I don't need to analyze it again. I'm just going to load in these things. Okay. 
Um, no one's is actually executing, right? It's good. You guys got these green boxes? Okay. So, no. Okay, so we're going to take this data, the pecan data here, and we're going to put it into uh, Skyline. And so we'll hit this save blib option for Skyline, like that. And we're just going to save a, a file here, and I'm just going to call it combined. Because we're, we're going to load both of these files at the same time. Okay? So I'm going to hit combined. And so what is actually going to do? It is actually going to do a little process. This is finished and it has created the blib. Uh, I assume that it's still running on some of your computers. Um, okay, good. Uh, I, I could keep talking for a while longer, but um, I guess the first thing we should do is like, if you guys have questions about this so far, um, about what we've done um, or what the program is trying to accomplish. Yeah, so it's not uncommon for, um, if you've got two fairly disparate samples, or even a protein that is changing in such an abundance that you can detect it in one sample, but you really can't detect anything real. There might be something integratable, but it's still not like, it's not something you could make a clean detection off of, right? Um, in those circumstances, uh, the program will decide, okay, I found this best 
in one of my samples. This is what it looks like. This is where to find it in retention hygiene. And what it's doing is actually retention hygiene warping between both of these files. And if it doesn't see it in any other file, it will actually go and look at that specific spot based on the retention hygiene warping and then integrate that. I'm going to open up uh, Skyline. Oh my. Um, is this. Uh, uh, how do I tell if this is daily? It does not. Okay. Uh, okay, well, think about what you've done while I figure this out. <laughs> I think so. Uh, oh, wait, this is an old... Awesome. All right, great. Clearly, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. <laughs> uh, but, so, uh, hopefully this is a big deal. So basically, what we're going to do is take that Spectrum library that was created by Walma and load it into Skyline and then have it use the information in that library to help Skyline pick peaks and to tell it where to look, okay? Uh, did that work? Do I have to restart it? Yeah, yeah. Good. Okay, great. So I'm going to open up a blank document here. What's that? Is everyone okay? Yeah, yeah. That combined file that's created. Did you save it 
combined file, right? Okay, great. Okay, so uh, as with basically all of those tutorials, the first thing we have to do is check your settings because you probably have bad settings for a different tutorial for this one. So um, uh, let's go to settings and go to preset settings. Okay, and again, you can follow this along in the, um, the document that I gave you, the PDF that I gave you. Uh, we'll look at digestion, make sure that it's trips in and that max miss cleavages is going to be one. And that uh, for um, uh, prediction, um, we want to make sure that you use measured retention time when present. And then we'll set that to a two minute integration. And then with the filter, we're going to set our minimum length to be six. And then make sure that none of these guys are checked. Okay, and then um, with library, we're not going to do anything about that. And modifications, um, we're not going to do anything about that. Uh, and quantification, we're not going to do anything about that. Okay. Great point. Uh, it's awesome. Okay, and I'm just going to hit okay. Did everyone do that okay? No issues? Okay, so, and then we're going to go check out the transition settings. Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is just make sure these are monoisotopic, basically because it's fairly high res data that we're talking about. Uh, so for the filter, um, we're going to set the precursor charges to be two and three, just like we're matching the program. For the ion charges, we're going to do one and two. And for the ion types, we're going to do Y and P. Okay, Y ions and precursor ions. We're going to integrate both of them out of the file. Now, one of the important things about pecan is that while it, it uses Need a precursor signal to store the peptide on that cell. And one of the things you'll see as you go on is that many of the peptides that you look at have either heavily interfered with precursors uh, because it is a complex human cell, or they don't even have a precursor signal at all that's measurable above the background. And that happens um, a not insubstantial amount of time. Okay, so uh, 1 and 2 and Y and P. Okay, we're going to integrate from the third ion, ion 3, to the last ion. And we're going to make sure that none of these special ions are checked. Um... Okay, and this is actually even a new option from what I have in my document. So, uh, and then we're going to make sure that the auto select all matching transitions is on. Okay. So, in the library tab, we're going to set this because, again, it's high res data. It's done with uh, Orbitrap uh, HF. Um, we're going to set this to 005. And check to make sure that if the library spectrum is available, you'll pick those ions, and that we're going to pick five of those ions. And then finally, and this is an important option here, you want to make it sure that it's set to from filtered product ions. This is the one that we were up late last night figuring out. Okay. So uh, at the instrument settings, um, we're going to take this method match tolerance and again do 005, 0 0.005, uh, and then 50 and then one, uh, 1500. 
And then in the full scan, we're going to actually make a bunch of settings. Okay, so focusing on this top panel, the MS1 filtering, we're going to set this to count for the isotopic peaks included. We're going to include three of those peaks. Okay, so this is basically measuring the monoisotopic. It's going to be centroided with a mass accuracy of 10 ppm. Again, we just set this in this uh, in uh, um, in Walnut too, and we're not going to use any uh, uh, isotopic labeling. Okay, so for the MSMS filtering, we have to set this to DIA because we're looking at DIA data. Uh, we're going to set the isolation scheme here to results only. What this means is it basically parses the, um, the isolation scheme from the file itself instead of trying to override it with something else. Okay. And uh, again, we're going to do centroided and 10 ppm. Okay. So down in this retention time filtering, we're going to use only scans within two minutes of what was in the library. Got it? Okay. So that's all of the sort of making sure that everyone's equal. Okay. All right, so the first thing we have to do, we have to do two things. The first thing we have to do is load the faster database into the program, and then we have to load the new only the actual data itself into Skyline. So in the settings here, again, for uh, peptide settings, we're going to click on the digestion tab here. Okay, we made sure that it said trips in and one, but we didn't set the background. So I'm going to hit down here and then add a new background proteome. We're going to load a really simple one here. We're just going to load the mTOR database itself, so I'm just going to call this mTOR. And then for the proteome file, I'm going to hit create. And uh, because this is Brendan's computer and I don't care, um, I'm just going to stick it in his documents. Uh, he'll never know. And then uh, I'm going to call this mTOR just as the ProTB. Yeah, I'm a terrible person. Cool? OK, so uh, you can say that wherever you want. You can put it on the desktop or anything. Um, I'm going to hit add file for the FASTAs, and we're going to load up those FASTA files. So again, here on this computer, it's in the F drive. It'll be in the tutorials, uh, the con, and again, I'm going to load up the mTOR file just to make things fast. Okay, so this has our 152 proteins. So those are the 152 mTOR associated proteins. OK, I'm going to hit OK. Yep. Uh, and now we're going to load the BLib, okay? So now go over to this library tab here. Okay. 
And we're going to hit Edit List and Add. Okay? And again, because I don't know what to name any of this stuff, I'm just going to call this mTOR again. That won't be confusing later, I hope. Uh, and then we're going to browse to the blib. Okay? And so that should be, again, on the F drive. Um, uh, I, I saved mine in the F drive. Um, hopefully you guys did too. Uh, so in the F, uh, that would have been the default option, would have been right where the raw files were. So uh, that would be in the F drive, tutorials, pecan, and then combined blib. So does anyone have trouble finding this? Awesome. Okay, great. So I'm going to open it. And then hit OK out to there. Good. All right. Now let's uh, let's take a look at this file. Uh, I guess I should save it. Okay, so this is what the the results from Pecan actually are. So these are the different peptides and their representation here. Um, some of them have a lot of peaks, and some of them don't have very many peaks. But these peaks are the ones. They have the right um, uh, shape, peak shape, to fit that particular peptide. Okay. Okay. So here I'm going to do um, associate proteins. So you see right down here, and then add all of these. Okay. And so what we're going to do is we're basically adding all of the peptides into our um, Skyline document. Okay. And I'm going to say yes. And so these would have been the ones that are matching to multiple proteins. I'm just going to load them in because um, we're not actually going to look at the biology. And it should tell you that uh, it found about 74 proteins. Hopefully you are about there. And then add all. Cool? Everyone good? All right, I'm going to close this. So now basically we've got all of these uh, listed, and it's got, for each of these different proteins, we'll have the different library spectra associated with them and the ions that are most appropriate for integrating for this particular match. Okay? So uh, now we just need to load in the raw files and then uh, start looking at the data. Okay? So I'll go to import, and then results. Oh, uh, you need to save the document first. Um, I guess this is in the downloads, so I'm just going to put it here, because I'm a terrible person. mTOR. All right, so you're going to import results. And so all of the basic settings are fine. Um, and then hit OK. Uh, and we have to navigate to the raw data. So again, I'll go to the F drive, tutorials, pecan, and then there are these two MZML files. Okay? And I'm going to open them. Um, it'll give you this option to do the removal. I'm just going to hit remove because I like to keep things simple. And uh, you can, if you click on the chromatogram right down here, you'll be able to see the progress as it's loading the file. So uh, while we wait for this one to go, do you guys have questions about again what we're doing in the sky or the setting things for this? Uh, okay, so um, so that it might be into the filter here. You have one, two, and YP, and then from three to last. Yeah. 
Uh, honestly, if you're if you don't have as much shadow, it should be okay. You You guys have other questions about what we're doing here? Why we have to load this twice? Uh, yeah, and the, the reason why is because the con is the detections, but it's not going to show you the actual data. You want to be able to look at it um, at least a little bit. Even if you're not going to look at all the data, you at least want to make sure that it is screwing up or that the con is screwing up. And that's The algorithm is designed for looking for DIA data. Yeah. So the Skyline algorithm is really designed for looking at, honestly, at SNL. And so it's good at picking peaks when you're only looking at a handful of transitions and you're only measuring a handful of transitions. Okay. So here, uh, and you have a pretty tight precursor isolation. Here, there are a lot of them, and it's really easy for Skyline to get confused. And so if you yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. No. You. Um, uh, uh, I. I would encourage you to do that. Actually, even with these files, and then take a look at, at what it looks like. It will frequently be picking the wrong piece, just because of how complex this data is. Right. I mean, the data that we're looking at here is 24 MB wide windows. It's pretty wide windows, and it's extremely complex for you. Right. So from this example file, um, using other approaches, I can detect about 60,000 peptides. From it. That's a ton of peptides, right? And they're all on top of each other because it's only a 90 minute gradient. Okay. But that said, they're still detectable out uh, of this data set if you use the right approaches to look for them. So, so you said this is a wrong Yeah. Uh, this, I think, is, is uh, very likely to stay where it is right now, um, mainly because it is, it is a representation of what is in the Pecan manuscript. It's a reasonable, it's a facsimile of the Pecan manuscript, um, which is uh, something that we, again, just got accepted and, uh, um, and we're using as this is the sort of final version of, of the program, right? So it probably won't change that that much in the long term. Um, and if it if it does, we'll probably do updates as we go. Sorry, so right now it's separate. Um, right now it's a different tool that you can use to interact with Skyline, but it's it's not going to be inside of Skyline. It's two runs, right? One for each MPA. Oh yes, uh, these are 24 MZ wide windows, and there's okay. there's 20 sorry 24 MZ wide windows, there's 25 of them. Okay. So it's a lot of windows. Oh, it's okay. Okay. So. Uh,
uh, does everyone have data loaded? All right, we're going to set it up so that it actually looks okay. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to do is go to, um, so this is actually kind of the meat of the con. So now we basically just kind of, this is what Skyline would give you as the representation. If you were to navigate this, actually, this would be kind of what Skyline would look like in terms of uh, the peptides that it sees. So one way to do this would be to, um, I'm just going to set uh, this down here, and I'm going to um, do view and then arrange graphs tiled. Uh, I kind of wanted this one on the bottom. Thank you, Skyline. Okay, and um, I'm going to set the transitions here. So I'm just going to right click on it and set transitions to all. And uh, we're going to do transitions to split graph as well. So we see precursors and products. Okay. And, uh, and so here, I'm also going to set it so that it's savitsky golade smooth. So transform savitsky golade Okay? So this looks like, you know, pretty reasonable peaks. But, I mean, you can take a look at this guy right here, right? His boundary is pretty, like, wonkily set. It really should extend out to this point, and then this side should be in. Does that make sense? Right? So, so Skyline has made a minor error in this particular peptide. Okay? So if I go up to import, file import, and instead of results, I'm going to import peak boundaries. Okay? This is really the meat of what you're going to get out of Pecan, is it's going to figure out what transitions are good and what peak boundaries are good. Okay? So again, we're going to navigate to that F5. We'll go to the tutorials, Pecan. Again, where are you saved the, the combined BLIB? And there should be this combined blib integration.txt. Okay, this is going to be the integration peak boundaries here. And I'm going to hit OK, and it will import those peak boundaries. And lo and behold, it reset this peak, so it actually is integrated correctly. Right? Okay, the first one looks about right too, right? I mean, this integration is good. One of the things that's actually really clear on this particular peptide is that this ion right here, the, uh, this is the plus two precursor, completely interfered with, right? Here, it's got this extra peak over here. This one's got this extra peak over here. If you were to do precursor integration, you know, if you were doing spectrum counting, you would have spectrum counting for benefits of a tool like that, or even Skyline, this would give you kind of a bad integration result, right? Because this dot product is probably not going to be very good. And this is why it's making the wrong choices. Skyline was making the wrong choices. But Pecan, because it's not needing to know what the precursor looks like, it can make a better choice about the shape of the peak, okay? So this is, uh, for example, one peptide here is a, um, this is two charge states of one peptide, right? And so one of the nice things, like this is a great example right here, this third peptide GTE down, where the precursor signal is garbage, right? That monoisotopic peak is nothing. It doesn't make any sense. But the transitions that it picks with the pond and MOMA, So it won't always make those correct choices, but one of the best ways to kind of like make sure that this data set is, is pretty solid is to go up to edit, refine, and advanced. And then we're going to set the minimum transitions per precursor. We're going to say we need at least three transitions. Right? And so So six total transitions per precursor, and then hit OK. And then we're going to do, again, edit, refine, and then remove empty proteins. So these would be proteins that didn't have any good peptides in the past. Okay? 
And so if you look through this data now, despite the fact that the precursor signal looks pretty noisy in a lot of these cases, we actually get pretty good integrations for the peptides.